Okay, we're going to uh, pick back up. We're heading when we left off a couple weeks ago. We were on chapter three, but I always like to go back and uh, kind of fill in where we are because what what I'm always trying to do is to track the thought of the writer. And you can't do that if you if you isolate things. So I want to go back just briefly and tell you at least where I see the flow of thought in the letter. And so I put it out there for you, explain this is how I see it. I invite you to share my understanding, but if you don't accept that invitation, so be it. I'm just explaining how I understand it, okay? Chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Peter, he tells these persecuted Gentile Christians in Asia Minor, he urges them, tells them to live such good lives among unbelievers, that though these unbelievers falsely accuse them of doing evil, They may be led to Christ by observing their good works and thus may be part of the chorus glorifying God when Christ returns to finalize history. So he's saying live such exemplary lives, such radically righteous lives, such good lives that even though they are uh, condemning you wrongly, that they may be drawn to the kingdom by your good lives. They may be led to that so that they will be part of that chorus that glorifies God on the day of visitation and this good living, it includes submitting to various authorities. And he starts with the governing authorities in chapter two, verses 13 to 17. He commands all of them to submit to governing authorities. And then in chapter two, verses 18 to 25, where we were looking two weeks ago, he commands slaves to submit to their earthly masters, even those who mistreat them. And I spent a good while talking about giving you some background on first century Greco-Roman slavery to put this in some kind of a context. They were called to endure injustice. OK, he calls them to mistreatment, wrong treatment, injustice. They're called to endure injustice at the hands of human authorities without being sullen or rebellious, which is, of course, the natural reaction. But without being that way, because Christ suffered this way and he left them an example in doing so. When he was mistreated, when he was insulted, when he was abused, he didn't return insult for insult. He took it, trusting in the Father, trusting in God, trusting in the one who will do right. And so he calls them through that example. And this kind of otherworldly behavior, this can draw pagans to the kingdom of God. You can see somebody who says, I don't know. What has happened to this slave of mine? But since he got involved with Jesus, he's a better servant than any I have. And you can see how this will draw people. Well, in chapter three, verses one to six, he commands wives to submit to their husbands. So he says, listen, live such good lives among the pagans that you'll be a light and you'll draw them. And this includes submitting to various authorities. It includes submitting to governing authorities. It includes slaves submitting to masters and wives. It includes wives submitting to husbands. And that's where I want to pick back up. I'll read chapter three, verses one to six. And then I want to say a little bit by way of background, just as I did in talking about the slaves. This is the same thing I said. when We discussed this subject in our study of Ephesians. And I do it because I think it's important to see a larger picture simply than the text that we're looking at. Okay, chapter three, verses one to six, he says, likewise, the wives be subject to your own husbands in order that even if some disobey the word, they will be won over without a word through the conduct of the wives by seeing your pure and reverent conduct. Do not let your adorning be outward of hair braiding and wearing gold or of putting on garments, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and tranquil spirit, which is of great value in the sight of God. For this way is is also how the holy women who in the past hoped in God adorned themselves by being subject to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You became her children, so do good and do not fear any intimidation. Now, let me say a little bit about the general remarks about the submission of Wives to husbands, which is a touchy issue in our society, which I think is part of the effort to undermine the word of God. But uh, men and women, they're created equally in the image of God and together they comprise mankind. So it's not like, listen, men are made in the image of God. Women aren't. They are created equally in the image of God. And it is together, male and female, that they comprise mankind. And you can see that in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, 
First Corinthians 11, verses 11 and 12, Paul points out that men and women are dependent on each other. In first Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 12 to 27, he makes clear that all who are in Christ are part of Christ's body and are equally precious. There are no second class citizens in the kingdom of God. And when it comes to our relationship with God. We stand on we, the ground is level before the cross. Peter, in chapter three, verse seven, which we'll look at in a minute, he describes husbands and wives as co-heirs of the gracious gift of life. And in terms of one's standing before God, one's relationship with God, Paul says in Galatians three twenty eight that there is neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. So there is this there is this spiritual equality created in the image of God. In Christ, we stand equally before God. It is not as though women are sitting over here in the shadows in terms of their relationship with God. Okay, that's an important thing to understand. In the marriage partnership of two spiritually equal human beings, a man and a woman, you have to say that today. But in a marriage, a marriage partnership of two spiritually equal human beings, the man bears the primary responsibility to lead the partnership in a God-glorifying direction. He is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, as Paul says in Ephesians 5.23. See, God in his sovereignty, God in his power and authority and right to choose, God in his sovereignty has bestowed on the husband the responsibility of headship or leadership. And in doing that, in bestowing that responsibility on the husband and in calling the wife to accept the husband's leadership, God is not saying he is not saying that the wife is inferior to less worthy or less capable than her husband. Husbands and wives simply have different functions that God in his sovereignty has assigned. Okay, so he's not saying they're inferior to, less worthy than, or less capable than her husband. But we have questions about that. We ask, we say, listen, we got, we have an issue with God. We say, look, why, why did you place the leadership responsibility exclusively on the husband or on the men in the spiritual family in the church rather than letting the wife lead where she is the more capable or equally capable partner? Why didn't you do it on the basis of merit, capability, so that in the case where the wife is the better uh, leader, why didn't you look? Why did you make it sex based rather than merit based? And that rubs us and we don't like that. And we have a beef with God about that. That's not right. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't make this. You, you shouldn't assign the leadership role in the bit. You should only do it on the basis of individual capability. It ought to be merit based. Well, you could just as well ask why God gave the tribe of Levi the exclusive responsibility to care for the tabernacle. Or why he gave the family of Aaron the exclusive responsibility of serving as priest. You say, look, why limit those roles to people who happen to be born in a certain lineage? Why do that? Why don't you just find all those who are the most capable of lugging tabernacle furniture? Right? Why don't we get this strong guy from Benjamin? He can carry it. Why did you limit it to, to somebody who happens to be born in a certain lineage rather than giving everyone equal access to those roles based on their merit or capability to perform them? You know, why isn't it merit based rather than tribe based? And that's the same beef we're raising when we talk about why isn't it capability or merit based rather than sex based? Okay, well, that was the same issue that came up precisely what led to Korah's rebellion in number 16. That same beef, that same issue gave rise to Korah's rebellion. Korah, a Levite and 250 community leaders, they opposed Moses and Aaron on the basis that they they should have equal access to God. This was rubbing them. This didn't seem right. They should have equal access to God. All Israel was holy. So no one family line should be exalted to the priestly function. This didn't seem right. This was a beef that they had, a complaint. And it was a challenge to God's right to choose select groups for specific roles. God had chosen a select group, a family line, 
for a specific role, the priestly function, and they didn't like it. And so they challenged that. All Israel's holy. What's up with this? And they challenged God's authority to do that. And as you know, or as I hope you know, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were swallowed by the earth. And the 250 community leaders were incinerated by God. You see, that was God's assessment of this rebellion against his right to choose select groups to serve in specific roles. And the spirit of Korah is alive. It is alive and well in those who fight this notion, who deny the notion that men are to be leaders. The husband is to lead in the family and men are to lead in the church. And it is common in our society, at least for the last 40 years, 40 or 50 years, where this is coming up. And the answer is, is listen, women, you're being you're being something's being done to you. You're being dissed. You need to rebel against this. Don't accept this. OK, this is out there. Now, it always comes out as enlightenment. I tell you, attacks on God always come out as enlightenment. You know, we've just gotten a, a larger, better view of it. But that's how this always happens. Nobody comes in and says, listen, I'm rebelling against God. Follow me. People come in and say, I have deeper insight. Okay, this instance, I'm telling you, that's not a deeper insight. It is it is rebelling against God's choice, his sovereign choice of doing that. Now, understand that a submissive or non leading role doesn't mean an inferior status, despite what is being preached to you. Ladies, despite what is being preached to you nonstop in the society, that a non-leading role means an inferior status. That is not true. And I think you can see that's not true from the fact that Jesus is God. Right? Jesus is one in nature, being, and essence with God the Father. So the Son is not inferior to or less worthy than the Father. They are one. Jesus is divine, and yet he's functionally subordinate to the Father. He willingly submits to the Father's authority. That's made explicit in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. You can see it in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, and 28. And it's demonstrated or corroborated in a number of different ways that he's functionally subordinate to the Father. You can see that he was sent by the Father. You see that in many places. I won't recite all the scriptures. Um, I'll put the notes up when I finish the class or maybe even before then I'll put all the notes up online and you can see the citations. He spoke the words of the father. He came to do the father's will. He revealed the father. He seeks to please, glorify and honor the father. He judges only as he hears from the father. Now, does that mean he's less in status? Does that mean he's somehow, uh, you know, not as worthy? It doesn't mean that, you see, and that's that's the thing that's being sold to people to get them to rebel, say you're being dissed. You see, you have a non leading role and that's saying that you're not as good, as wise, as smart, as competent. And you say, oh, yeah, you want to bet I am, too. Shut up, dear. OK, I'm telling you, this is the the battle rages and the enemy is subtle. Now, Jesus being in very nature God, if he can submit to the father's authority, then certainly a wife can submit to her husband's leadership without denying her equal dignity and value. Can't she? Jesus can submit to the father without denying his equal dignity and value. Then certainly a wife can submit to her husband's leadership without denying her equal dignity and value in that she's acting like Christ. And that parallel is specifically drawn in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. She's acting like Christ in doing that. Now, why, are we ashamed of that, ladies? We're going to talk a little bit about not being intimidated. But you ask yourselves in our society, will you stand up and say, listen, I submit to my husband. Oh, you don't want to say that, right? Because you think that in our crowd... You'd be making some kind of statement that says, oh, I just can't. You know, my husband is I'm just worthless, you know, right? In our society, there is tremendous pressure for you to say that it's a denial of your competence. It's a denial of your equality is how you look at it. Okay, and here you can see, I hope that, you know, you see that you're acting like Christ. Why wouldn't we be willing to stand up and say, God has called me to this. I am a daughter of God. I am going to live that way unashamedly. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That's part of the burden of being a Christian. 
Right. What are they going to say? The, the, the world's not going to like it. The world is not going to like it, but we need to carry it. Now, submission to Christ, when, when we're talking about submitting to Christ, there are obviously distinctions that need to be noted, right? Submission to Christ is expressed in unquestioning obedience because he is God. He is the holy, the infallible creator and savior. There can be no justification for questioning his will or attempting to enlighten him or set him straight. Right. He's God. So there's a distinction here. Husbands, on the other hand, I know this is going to come as a shock to you wives, but husbands, we are limited, sinful human beings. And we can make very foolish and sometimes sinful choices. That's not true of Christ. But that's true of us. We are limited, sinful human beings, bent, twisted, and we can make foolish choices. And we can even make sinful choices. So submission to husbands is expressed in supporting the husband's non-sinful decision. Not because of his inherent qualities. Okay, not because of who they are. But because God has given the responsibility for leadership in the family to the husband, when the husband has finally chosen a course of action, the wife willingly supports and follows that choice. That is how it is to be. She does not resent it. She does not seek to sabotage it or undermine. She goes, OK, you go ahead. We'll do that. Now you watch. No, see, that is that's not how we submit to Christ. That is not how we do that. Now, of course, if a husband chooses a sinful course of action, the wife can't support it. Hey, babe, let's go rob a bank. She can't go along with that. See, the husband's authority is from the Lord, and he has no authority to push one of God's children into sin. You see, in that case, that wouldn't be a uh, following a husband into sin. That's not a submission that's fitting in the Lord, as the term is used in Colossians 3.18. Now, unlike the submission of, of, of the situation of submitting to Christ, the wife, she has to help her husband in the discharge of his leadership responsibility. He has a responsibility that God has placed on him. And I know that women oftentimes think that the burden in that arrangement is all one way. But the burden of leadership is not all that easy. OK, you might say, oh, poor baby. But I'm telling you, there are times you see when it's not easy to be the one that has to make the call on things. And so we have this situation where husbands have this. This has been given to them. And unlike the situation in submitting to Christ, wives have to help their husbands in the discharge of that responsibility. And that often requires them. As helpers, as somebody invested in the family, as somebody blessed and talented, it requires them to inform, to question, to advise and correct their husbands. OK, they don't just sit there and go, yes, oh, great one, whatever you say, when you know your husband's sitting there and he's factually wrong, he's going to make a decision. Say, What do you know? The interest rates are 20 percent. I think, no, that's point two, dear. You're not just going to sit here and go, well, well that, you know, that would be, how would that be? That would be not using your talent and ability. You have to work to help the family. And so, yes, you have to inform, question, advise, correct where that's necessary. The wife is a non-leading partner in the family, and she is called to use all of her abilities, all of her talents, all of her intellect, and all of that to bless her husband or family. And she's sitting there like this going... I know this guy's walking off a cliff, but watch, it'll be fun. It'll be great when he hits, and then I'll go over to him and go, you see? No, so you, you see, so it's, it's, there's a distinction in the submission because your partner's leading the family. He happens to have the leadership responsibility, but because he is a sinful human being, the submission is necessarily different and qualified from what you give to Christ. You need to help him in this discharge of his responsibility. Now, in a healthy marriage... Husbands and wives can almost always come to a consensus on what course of action should be should be taken. That's been my experience. I hope it's been yours that you, just, you sit here together and as a team, you sit here and say, OK, you know, what do you what do you think? All right. You know, this is and then together, you almost always can do that. But occasionally husbands and wives cannot. And in those situations where a mutual decision can't be reached. The wife is called by God to yield to her husband's decision. And there's a fellow, James Hurley, some decades ago, he wrote a book called Man and Woman in Biblical Perspective. And I've quoted him many times 
uh, since then. I think it's very important to see the spirit in which these kinds of decisions are made is crucial. And he expresses this, the spirit in which those decisions should be made, I think, in a very good way. Hurley says, the manner in which such decisions are handled is crucial. The husband may not be high-handed and stubborn, knowing that she will finally have to give way. You need to sit here. What do I care about you? Shut up, shut up. Yeah, yeah. I, look, I'm King Allison. You're nobody. You guys remember the honeymooners? I'm mean, the old one, you know, with police. And I'm the King Alice. You're nobody. Okay? So this idea, see, you can't be high-handed and stubborn. No, and listen, she's going to have to cave anyway, so I just won't even listen, think, talk, consider the possibility this could be one of the many times I've been wrong. I'm not even going to think about that. Oh, he says, neither may the wife be grudging and resentful. That's not the manner of our response to Christ. In the last analysis, when the two can devote no more time to individual and joint seeking of the grace of God to permit them to come to one mind or to be willing to yield to the other and exchange along the following lines is in order. Husband, not because I am inherently wiser or more righteous, nor because I am right, although I do believe I am or I would not stand firm, but because it is finally my responsibility before God, we will take the course which I believe is right. If I am being sinfully stubborn, may God give me, may God forgive me and give me the grace to yield to you, to see the wisdom of your position, to see that. See, may he, may he do that. Because look, when the decision is made, God has given me the responsibility. I'm answering for it. So I have to do what I judge is best. I can't try to trick myself. If I think this is the right way to go on that day, I want to go to the Lord and say, Lord, you know my heart. You know that I believe this was right. Okay? And so so I'll put that before him. And he'll say, well, you know, you should have listened to your wife. Okay, but I, I did the best I could there. I'll take that. Rather than saying, Lord, I acted when I didn't think this was right because I was afraid of my wife. Can't do that. Okay? Wife. Not because I believe you are wiser in this matter. I don't. Or more righteous. Nor because I accept that you are right, because I don't or I would not oppose you. But because I am a servant of God who has called me to honor your headship, I willingly yield to your decision. If I am wrong, may God show me. If you are wrong, may he give you the grace to acknowledge it and to change. Now, it just seems to me that if we had this kind of spirit, this kind of thing, that this wouldn't be an issue. I just think if people had this kind of attitude in their decisions about the husband's leadership responsibility, if the husband didn't go around like, you know, listen, I'm the King Allison, you're nobody. If he didn't do that, and if they worked in this kind of spirit in those instances where they couldn't agree, I just think it would be beautiful. Okay. All right. Let's go on. Well, now we'll actually talk about the text here. All of that I say is way of background. Just the big picture. Okay. Now. See, he says, likewise, the wise, see, as, as slaves submit to earthly masters, knowing that God calls them to do so. And that's how we understood in the fear of in, it says in with fear. And I was making the point that that's fear of God. OK, knowing that as slaves do that, knowing that God calls them to do it, they submit to their earthly masters. So wives are to be subject to their own husbands, knowing that God calls them to do it. Likewise, just like the out of fear of God that the slaves submit to earthly masters, they do it knowing that the Almighty has called them to that. Wives are to submit to their husbands, knowing that God has called them to do that. Now, the purpose of that submission that Peter highlights is that in this context is the potential for winning to the faith the unbelieving husbands. This isn't a guarantee, but Peter is saying, listen, you need to live in submission to your husband And this may optimize or improve the likelihood that your husband will cease rebelling against the gospel and will come to accept it. See, they can be one to the Lord, meaning they can be persuaded to accept the truth of the gospel they've already heard, by the way. See, that's implicit in the fact that they have they have uh, disobeyed the word. They have been presented with the word, the gospel, and they've rejected it. They have disobeyed the word. So they've already they understand the gospel. It's already been presented to them. But the purpose here that he's highlighting is, look, they can be one to the Lord. They can be persuaded to the truth of the gospel that they've already heard without further verbal persuasion, whether from the wife or somebody else, because they've heard it. They've rejected it. And now as the wife lives this 
conduct of reverence and submission that they can be moved by that. You saw the same kind of thing with the slaves. I don't know who this Jesus is, but my wife, since she got tied up with him, is a better woman. <laughs> she's terrific. <laughs> she's just, you know, she's the, you know, just a ter- tremendous wife. And let's see, this draws people. What is there about the connection to Christ that has so changed my wife that now she acts this way? She's gracious and loving and forgiving more so than before. And this is what he's focusing on here. You see that without this further verbal persuasion, they can be drawn to seeing the truth of Christ by the pure and reverent conduct of their wives, which includes this submission that he's talking about. And then he warns them not to let their adorning be outward. Okay, not to let their adorning be outward through things like hairstyle and uh, hairstyles and gold and clothes, but to let their adorning be through the kind of person they are on the inside. See, specifically through having a gentle and tranquil spirit, a submissive spirit, which is of great value in God's sight. Now, I don't think this is a flat ban on on uh, items of outward adornment. Okay, some of you may disagree and think that everybody needs to wear burlap or something. I don't. Okay, I don't think this is a flat ban on outward adornment. Let me, I'll tell you a little bit why I think that I I don't think it is. I think it's a ban on allowing such externals to substitute for inner beauty. A godly woman can, quote, dress up, see, within the limits of modesty, meaning not being so flashy or revealing so as to reveal a, a... you know, an inappropriate desire for attention, whether it be through flashiness or through being revealing. It's the thing where somebody sits here and goes, whoa, did you see that? OK, there's something about everybody. Look at me. OK, I think a godly woman can dress up within the limits of modesty and still have her adorning be the beauty of the inner person. Though she is dressed up, her spirit remains her true attractiveness. OK, there are a couple of things that make me think this in Ezekiel chapter 16. Verses 10 to 13, God is speaking metaphorically of his role as Jerusalem's husband. I understand it's a metaphor. okay? but still in that context, he's speaking of his role as Jerusalem's husband. He says he clothed her in embroidered cloth, fine linen and silk, that he adorned her with ornaments and put bracelets on her wrist and a chain on her neck, and that he put a ring in her nose, earrings on her ears and a crown on her head. Okay, it's a metaphor, but it suggests to me that outward adornment is not inherently sinful. You see, because here's God saying, I called you out and look how I decked you. Well, you say if it was inherently sinful to be decked, why would he deck her? Okay, I, I think there's something there that says, listen, no, the point is not that. The point is allowing that to substitute for the inner beauty of the person. At least that's what I, what I think he's saying. Now, the problem comes when the external beauty is all there is. And that God's wife there, Jerusalem, trusts in that beauty and then goes after other men, which in the metaphor represents foreign gods and illicit political relationships. But still the fact that he decks her says something to me. Also in Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, the woman's external ornamentation is spoken of positively, which again seems hard to me for me to square with the notion that any kind of ornamentation is inherently sinful. OK, I think if, it, if it's to the point, see, where it becomes immodest, where you have to be the center of attention, that's a reflection of something. Uh, but just the fact that you have ornamentation, it doesn't seem to me that it's inherently wrong. Here's what the Marshall says in his. This is in Marshall's commentary on the. I think first and maybe just I can't remember if it's just first Peter, but he says it is true that Peter's statement might well be translated. And I would say interpreted your beauty should not so much come from outward adornment. But rather, it should be that of your inner self, though desire to be beautiful and attractive is manifestly a commendable one. Outward beauty, however, however much desirable, is secondary to beauty of character. The desire for outward beauty could easily lead to the sins of pride and vanity, as well as of a wrong use of money. So this is how I see it. So I don't think that there's a flat ban. I think godly women can dress up within the limits of modesty. And yet this is that the, the, they still have their true beauty is what is the character. OK, so at least that's my take on that. Now here back in chapter three, verses one to six, Peter says that it's it's by possessing a gentle and tranquil spirit expressed in submission to their husbands, that godly women of biblical history. That's how they adorn themselves. Exhibit a being Abraham's wife, Sarah. 
Okay, how did they adorn themselves? It was with this attitude of submission. You see, and that, that, I tell you, I know how that rubs in the society. I know how that rubs the ladies. They're just going, come on now. You know, I know my husband. <laughs> I know all his warts. What are you talking about submitting? That's how godly women, he says in biblical history, that's how they, they uh, adorn themselves. And her submission to Abraham's leadership, it's represented in Genesis 18, 12, where she refers to him as her Lord. Okay, that's where this, this notion comes from. Her obedience and her submission to him is packed into this reference in Genesis 18:12, where she refers to Abraham as Lord. And a fellow named Dan McCartney, he writes in his, his doctoral dissertation on the use of the Old Testament in the first epistle of Peter. McCartney says, although Genesis 18:12 does not give in itself a direct example of Sarah's obedience, The fact that even in this negative instance in Sarah's life, she referred to Abraham as my Lord would have indicated to Peter. And it did so to his contemporaries that submission was her customary attitude toward Abraham. You go and you because you go to 1812 and you're saying, well, it's simply she calls him Lord there. How do we get the rest of this? And that's how you get it. See, in that context that she called him Lord, it's indicative of a general attitude of submission. And so Peter is saying, listen, that's how the godly women in the past adorned themselves. You know, they weren't putting on boxing gloves. They weren't sitting there showing how, you know, how they can be. You know, yeah, I can stomp all over my husband. I can run the house. I can do this. That's not attractive in God's eyes. In our culture, it may be, oh, what a woman. Look at her. She just stomps all over her husband and treats him like dirt. Okay, no, that's, I, know, I know how our society is. That's not how it is. See, this gentle and tranquil spirit, this submissive spirit that we are trying to wring out of our ladies in our society, that is something that's beautiful in God's eyes. And that's what you see in the biblical uh, women in biblical history. How did they adorn themselves? That's, that's how. And so that's how he's calling Christian wives. That's how they are to be. He tells the wives he's addressing that they became Sarah's children. I get, I like this. He says in verse 6, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you became her children. They became Sarah's children. They did this, meaning that in their conversion to Christ, they became her descendants in that they shared her faith in God. See, through faith, I've talked about this before, through faith they were grafted into true Israel. They were grafted into the Ethnic Israel of faith, right? That subset of ethnic Israel, ethnic Israel that trusted in God and believed his words about who Jesus is. They accepted the Christ. They are true Israel. Why? Because they're manifesting the faith of Abraham. And it's not simply those who are descended from Abraham who are Jews. It is those who have his faith. So we have ethnic Israel and then within ethnic Israel, We have true Israel, which are the Israelites who express faith in God. So the church is what? Jewish at its root. The apostles are Jewish. The first Christians are Jewish. And then what happens? As the mission spreads to Gentiles, they then are grafted into true Israel and they comprise new Israel. You see, and you can see these concepts. Peter doesn't go into all this, of course, but you can see this in Romans 4.16 Romans 9, 6 and 8, Romans 11, 13 to 20, Galatians 3, 7 to 9, Galatians 3, 29, 6, 16, and Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. You can see these concepts there. So when he says to her that, look, he says that you became her children. He's talking to these wives and says, listen, when you became a Christian, you became a descendant of Abraham and Sarah. This lineage of true Israel Ethnic Israel of faith into which you have now been grafted by faith, as Paul says in Romans. So you became her, you became her descendants when that happened. And then he tells them, he says, listen, as those of Sarah's lineage, they're to what? They're to do good. He says, so do good, which includes submitting to your husbands. As difficult as it may be, submitting to your husbands and do to do right. And then they're not to fear any any intimidation that they may receive as the result of their faith. There have been some tremendous examples of heroic Christian women. I'm talking about women who are tortured, you know, just tortured. And uh, so he sits and he tells them, listen, ladies, you know, you are you're a disciple of Christ. 
You are Sarah's children. You are in that lineage of faith. And you are not to be intimidated by the world because of what comes on you. They're suffering persecution. You're not to be intimidated. Now, that's tough. That's why I was bringing out before. Are we even intimidated by saying, I submit to my husband? Are we intimidated so that we wouldn't say, I want to say that. That'll make me sound like I'm backward. I'm not really hip. I haven't heard of the woman's movement. You say, right. I mean, isn't that right? <laughs> right? He says, don't be. See, what's your feeling here is intimidation. No. Look, I'm a Christian. I stand with God. This is what God has called me to do, and I honor him, and I do it, and I'm not ashamed of it. And then they'll laugh and, you know, all that stuff. Sure they will. But see, he's, don't be intimidated. And that goes not only for that, that goes for everything he's talking about. Now, he says in chapter 3, he's only got five minutes for husbands. That's great. That's how I work it all the time. But he says in chapter 3, verse 7, The husbands in turn live with your wives according to knowledge, paying honor to the female as to a weaker vessel, and also to co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. See, having addressed the fact that wives are to submit to their husbands... Peter mentions the corresponding duty of husbands to their wives. See, whereas wives are to submit to their husbands, husbands are called to live with their wives in accordance with their knowledge of God's will, which is that they pay honor to their wives. Okay, they are, they are to submit out of fear of God or likewise to those who, you know, to the uh, slaves submit to the earthly masters. Likewise, women. Why? Because out of fear of God, of knowing that God calls me to do this. Husbands, out of knowledge of God's will, which is what? That you honor your wives. Okay, there are different, you, know, you see different duties put on husband when Paul talks about it. But this one is something that's crucial. A husband pays honor to his wife. He says that she is important and significant in how he talks to her, how he talks about her, and in the kind of priority they get, that he gives to her needs and to their relationship. See, treating her with disrespect. Running her down to other people is not honoring your wife. When you talk to your wife like she's an idiot, you know, yeah, 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 right, right. You don't know anything. You're not honoring her. You're disrespecting her. And when you go and talk to other people about your wife and trash her, you're not honoring her. What are you doing? You're running her down. Well, what's God call you to do? He calls you to honor her. He calls you to hold her up as valuable and important. And that's what we have to do, brothers. We are called to do that by God. We need to do it. Now, Peter says the husband pays honor to his wife as to a weaker vessel. Okay, the wife, the female is a weaker vessel physically and positionally. Looking at me, you may not think so. You say, look, you know, 90% of the women throw you in a trash can. I'm talking generally. Right? Generally. Men are much larger and stronger and could basically, you know, uh, just tear a woman apart, basically. Uh, now, I know they got boxers and, you know, they're taking steroids. I know that. But I'm talking generally. See, generally it's an understood truth that men are stronger than women. Bigger physically and stronger. So they are weaker both in a physical sense, but they're also weaker positionally. Okay? In that they don't have the leading role in the household or particularly that time, in society at large. Okay, so they are weaker physically and positionally, but they are not weaker mentally, morally, or spiritually. You see, they are weaker, they are physically weaker, and they are in a lesser position in that they are the non-leading partner. And in that society, the husband certainly, he had a greater uh, social power. So they're weaker in that sense. And this physical and positional weakness makes the wife more vulnerable to mistreatment and therefore, in God's eyes, especially worthy of protection. He is the God of the vulnerable. He is especially interested in protecting the vulnerable, the weaker. When when in James chapter 2, what's he talking about? Poor guy comes in. This guy's got no status. He's got anything. got all these rich people around sitting there saying, you sit over there, you know. You know. God says, oop, oop. You don't do that. He's interested. Widows. Is God interested in widows? Why? Because it was difficult for them in society. Okay, so he is particularly uh, acutely attuned to the vulnerable. 
And dare I say, this is relevant to abortion. This is one of the things that drives me crazy as we as a society stand and watch the slaughter of tens of millions of children without a voice. And we sit here and say, well, that's political. You can't get involved in that. That's political. It's moral as I'm standing here. Okay? As moral as I'm standing here. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, all right. Now, the wife is, 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 the wife is also to be honored as a co-heir of salvation. And in terms of her relationship with God, in terms of her relationship with God, she's no way weaker, right? It's not like she's over here. The husband stands fully before God, justified, whole, you know, being held close by God. And the wife or the woman's over here. That's not the case. Paul says in Galatians 3, 26, 29, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, clothe yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed heirs according to the promise. Okay. So not weaker in that sense at all. And notice that this honoring of wives is so important that the failing to do so will disturb the husband's relationship with God and thus hinder his prayers. See, the Christian who insists on mistreating his wife, who insists on just ignoring her, dishonoring her, disrespecting her, or maybe even worse, Christian who insists on that can't expect to come to God as though all's well. Yeah, yeah, I know that you call me to do that. I know that I'm what I'm supposed to but I don't care. I'm going to treat her the way I want to, and then you come to God. You think he's come to God as though all is well? Well, rather, he can expect to be disciplined Through God's refusal to answer his prayer, and that is God saying, you need to repent and get right with your wife. You need to treat her the way that I called you. I heard that bell. Thank you for coming.